Welcome everyone to our latest episode in Making Sense of Crypto and Web3. And today I'm joined by a special guest, uh, Jeff Emmett, who is a token engineering researcher and communication lead at Block Science and a co-founder of the Common Stack. He draws inspiration from mycelial networks and bimometric processes, and his goal is a toolkit for customizable regenerative economies that support purpose-driven communities. And he's the author of rewriting the story of human collaboration and challenges and approaches to scaling the global commons. And I also just want to give for new listeners a little bit of context before I dive in with Jeff, which is this series is an in-depth exploration of crypto and Web3, which has many people who are at least listening will know has become a massive phenomenon. Very bold claims are being made about its potential impact, claims that go far beyond classic technology boosterism of better or faster, to claims for the radical transformation and improvement of our economic and social systems. At the same time, there is an extraordinary level of debate about these claims, even on basic points and definitions. And overall, this is a very controversial and even polarizing topic with strong pro and anti camps. This series is about helping us and you and anyone interested in this make sense of what is going on and to evaluate for themselves some of these key claims. We're starting by exploring specific hopes and aspirations and their associated ideologies. And one final point I want to make before we dive in is that throughout this series, we're taking, we're making a real effort to steal man, as we would say, any position, to put the best version forward of any position, whether it's positive or critical, and then, ev and then evaluate it from there. And what that means is that it doesn't mean that I or even people I'm interacting with necessarily endorse everything we're saying. We're trying to set out the best version of it possible and then examine it critically and open-mindedly. Well, thank you, Jeff, for joining today. Um, I thought we could start out by maybe, first of all, actually saying a little bit, just like very briefly, how did you come to this area? Like, how did you end up on, in this topic? You know, um, that would be actually a really interesting just thing to ask a little bit of a biographical background. Yeah, certainly. Um, so my uh, my official training, uh, I mean, university uh, topic of study was electrical engineering, which I think set the kind of um, the, the stage for a lot of the, the work that I'm in now. Um, but I kind of took a left turn after graduation and ended up traveling. Um, I was in the travel and tourism industry as a, as a guide for about a decade, um, working in Southeast Asia and Central America, um, parts of Africa. Um, and really, you know, seeing different different perspectives and different ways people lived. Um, you know, I, I never really thought I would be back in the engineering space, um, but around, you know, 2016, 2017, um, I was really looking around the world and, and wondering what was going on. There seemed to be this, you know, uh, disconnect between our political systems and, and what the world needed. Um, Brexit, uh, Trump was elected president. There was this kind of far right populism sweeping the globe. Um, and, and I mean, on top of environmental crises, biodiversity loss, you know, all everything going on. And, and I was kind of just looking around going, what is happening and, and how can we address these, these problems? And um, kind of went down the rabbit hole of, you know, a whole number of, of various tools and, you know, electoral reform, universal basic income, um, a whole bunch of, of exploration. And then I um, got, to, got to blockchain and kind of went down the rabbit hole a bit um, on the insistence of a friend. Um, and, and, you know, it was probably a, a bit of a naive epiphany, but I do remember one day in, in my garage, actually, I got up and I was running around the house screaming, it's blockchain, it's blockchain, it's, you know, that's, that's going to fix everything. And of course, you know, nothing's going to fix everything. Um, but I think there is a, a really important tool here. It's a kind of a new, a new substrate of design. Um, and I think we're, we're still at such early stages of this technology and there is such potential um, for, you know, uh, higher level coordination systems or, or maybe even lower level coordination systems um, that we can create, you know, um, we have we have a new substrate of design, almost like silicon is a is a design substrate for microchips. We now have tokens, which is uh, a design substrate for coordination, um, potentially at, at higher levels than than we've enabled before. Um, so that was kind of my my foray into the space. And, and of course, there's been a lot of um, learning since there's no there's no tool that will fix all the problems. That's that's the first thing. I think there's a lot of naivety in in the space and optimism, which which is great, um, but it can also be a little bit blinding. 
Um, you know, there's there's a lot of reinventing the wheel, uh, which I think can can we can definitely learn a lot from existing systems um, and continue to build um, with those systems. And and you know, we don't have to develop everything all over again. Um, but yeah, I think that's that's kind of what what got me into the the crypto space. Um, and uh, what's what's kept me here is you know a lot of really interesting uh, bleeding edge research that I think uh, can can help us solve some really big problems. Wow, thank you. Well, let's come to a first question in, 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 that I wanted to ask here, which was, I, I think it's uh, fair to say that I understand, you know, one one of the areas you'd be associated with inside of the crypto space is what is called regenerative finance or REFI, in contrast to, uh, you know, DeFi, uh, which is like decentralized finance. Um, could you say a little bit about what REFI is? What is regenerative finance? Um, you know, and I know it might be sprawling, so don't want, you know, the nutshell version, but give a rough indication of what you take it to be or understand it to be. Sure. So the, the term uh, DeFi is, is sort of like de decentralized finance. So this would be contrasted to centralized finance, you know, our existing um, banking system, economic system, where, um, you know, we, we have these markets, they're often intermediated by major players, you know, we, we buy ETFs, those are created by BlackRock or JP Morgan or, or whatnot, they basically um, centralize and, and control a lot of our financial in infrastructure. Um, so what, what DeFi offers is um, sort of decentralizing that capacity to create um, instruments for uh, borrowing, loaning, um, um, leverage. Um, I mean, the, the DeFi toolkit is, is quite massive. Um, but what a lot of um, you know, critics have mentioned is that it's kind of empty finance, and, and it is. Um, so where ReFi comes in is trying to take those same mechanisms, you know, mechanisms like liquidity mining or, I, I mean, proof of work, proof of stake in general, um, and rather than using it for sort of, um, you know, finance for the sake of finance, uh, it's, it's putting regenerative practices and principles at the heart um, and then using those mechanisms to support that regenerative um, endeavor. And I think that's, that's absolutely necessary in this technology is real value. There's, there's a bit of a, a meme joke going on in, in the um, crypto common space, uh, which is where I spend a lot of my time is um, you know, these, these tools need to do something other than just create more, you know, magic internet money. That's, that's what most of DeFi does is you put in your magic internet money and your magic internet money grows and then you take out more later. Um, sure, that's great. You know, it gets the interest of people who are here just for the money. And unfortunately, I would say that's, that's probably most of the space. You know, there, there is, a, you know, rampant speculation. It's basically, you know, a giant casino on the internet, uh, most of it. Um, of course, there's, there's, you know, this very interesting and emergent space uh, where, you know, people are, are acclaiming refi is the way that we can, you know, fund the planting of trees or fund the drawdown of, of carbon from the atmosphere or essentially using these mechanisms to, you know, utilize magic internet money to do, um, you know, regenerative ecological services uh, for the planet, which we, which we sorely need. So if I just play that back, so leaving aside, we have traditional finance, which is for, you know, traditionally finance is a main a means of transferring capital between two parties. Um, in, and there's various methods of doing that. There's people who have capital investors or uh, people who want to lend their money and they want to transfer it to people who want to borrow it. So, you know, I, I've got my money I've saved and you want to build your house, you need a mortgage or you're starting a company. And the thing is over time, or even perhaps originally it's quite centralized. It goes through a limited number of banks. And the whole point of like blockchain in general is it's all more decentralized. And so there was DeFi, which kind of means we've got like, you know, uh, the equivalent of stock exchanges, but which are decentralized in a sense, or there's no central um, exchange in a way, et cetera, et cetera. And there's, you, that's the thing you said, the issue is that really a lot of that is kind of empty. It's empty finance. It's kind of finance, you know, even worse than traditional finance, some ways it's just finance for the sake of it, you know, and then there's this regenerative, which is this real excitement of like, and relates to the comments of like, well, but maybe we could, we could turn these tools or use these tools for really like profoundly important and valuable purposes of, the, of addressing the climate crisis, of addressing the ecological crisis, of, of sustaining the commons in other areas, you know, building software, 
etc and that's that's what then refi is is kind of regenerative finance it's using these tools in that area is, is that right. a, and please yeah yeah I've definitely so you are wrong because it's yeah yeah and and i think it, it you know there's it, it goes a step beyond um you know and and i don't know if this is too much of a, of a rabbit hole for this conversation but even the traditional monies that we use in in you know the the traditional economies, you know, the, the US dollar, the Canadian dollar, these are, these are all um, economic monocultures that are enforced by colonial nation states. Um, and I mean, just, just putting it out there that these are not the most healthy forms of currency. Um, they're, they're imposed, they're um, centralized. I mean, in way, centralization and decentralization isn't one thing. Um, yes. You know, the way money is created is actually fairly decentralized, but the way it's controlled is still fairly centralized. Um, and there's there's a lot of issues with using enforced monoculture economies. And I think what this technology, one of the most important things it offers is the potential for economic permaculture. Um, these booms and busts we see in the global economy, I mean, we would see those booms and busts if the government of Canada uh, imposed on every farmer that they could only grow apples. We would see massive booms and busts in crop production, um, and and we understand that in agriculture, but we don't seem to click with that in in economics yet. And I think what what this movement really offers is the separation of of money and state, and the potential for um, a, a plethora of various currencies um, that will enable much more granular control and better feedback loops um, than than current um, nation state economies can. Um, and I, I think that's a, a fundamental problem um, that, that causes all untold number of problems down the line um, from, you know, ecological devastation to social uh, inadequacy to, um, you know, funding wars and not and not uh, climate regeneration. Um, yeah. And I, I think we're, we're at the beginning of, of something really important in, uh, in exploring these kinds of tools. Yeah, so just to take that, it takes us back. We might not dive onto it, into a more classic kind of point about why Bitcoin or, you know, other forms of, you know, potentially kind of cryptocurrency, which are not controlled, are sort of have, could be transformative in the economic sense. I mean, I, I, we, I think we could come back to that uh, if we have time, because it's another intriguing topic. It's one we've talked about a bit in other, other episodes. I want to focus, but it's interesting to say, so you all subscribe to that one, as well as the basic refi points. There's kind of like taking, you know, different kinds of money, make this difference to how, we, you know, profoundly how we can run our economy. Let's come a little bit then into the, the refi side, which is around the kind of the commons, because they said you're one of the founders of Common Stack, And on the side, it says, that common stack is about sustaining public goods. I think we are building, it says we're building common space, microeconomics, microeconomies, sorry, to sustain public goods through incentive alignment, continuous funding and community governance. Now, what, just to start, so the crucial phrase for me this rather was sustain public goods. And um, then you're talking about how the how, but can you say a little bit about, maybe just first of all, for our, for our, for our listeners, like what do we mean can we give an example of what we mean by a public good or, yeah, just, just illustrate that or, you know, or the commons, I think often they're related together. And then maybe something about how, what's the challenge in sustaining them and then how you support sustaining public goods. Sure. Um, so, so public goods, um, if, if anyone wants to have a look deeper, highly recommend the work of uh, Eleanor Ostrom. Um, and, and the study of the commons, I mean, you, would, you, you definitely come across her multiple times. Um, there, there's a matrix of, of four types of goods that's worth looking up if you're interested. There's uh, private goods, club goods, common goods, and public goods. Um, and our, you know, we have mechanisms that are very good at producing private goods and club goods. Private goods are things that are mine and not yours. Um, and they're, they're scarce. So, you know, there's only a certain number. So like my shoes are a private good, right? My shoes are not your shoes. When I'm wearing them, you can't wear them. Um, a club good would be something that um, you can put a gate around, but it doesn't actually run out. So like a golf course or, or a movie theater might be more like a club good. Um, we, we have effective business models for these types of goods. Um, you know, we have actually probably too many private goods. We've got a thousand different brands of toothbrush um, you know, we, we've got business models to produce to, to produce 
uh, private goods and club goods. Where it gets a little more tricky is on the other side of the matrix, the common goods and public goods. And the tricky part is we can't control who accesses them. So things like clean air or clean water or open source code or anything that is um, you know, freely available um, and thus can be overrun. So, you know, there, there is the possibility that too many farmers can graze on a common field, for example. Um, and this was the, uh, the seminal example of uh, the tragedy of the commons, quote unquote, uh, from Garrett Hardin in, in the, um, I think the 50s or 60s, um, wrote about how the commons is unsustainable, it will always be overrun uh, by the people within it, and therefore we should have, you know, government intervention or, or some form of privatization to protect uh, these shared resources. And Eleanor Ostrom's life uh, was basically, uh, or her work, um, was going through real world examples of communities that manage shared resources as a commons, um, and, she, and she proved Garrett Hardin's tragedy of the commons wrong, or at least that he was talking about the tragedy of the non-commons. So the commons is, is also a, a bit of a tricky word. Um, a lot of people think that it's referring to a resource. It's actually, I think the best definition uh, that I've heard was, was from David Bollier and the commons is a combination of three things. It's a, a common resource like clean air, um, a community that uses it, and the rules and procedures by which they use it. So things like you know the, the Atlantic fisheries in, in Canada, um, the fisheries, it's an open resource, but if every fisherman overfishes, we will destroy the resource. And, and I mean, we this has happened and, and is I'm happening. <laughs> yeah, um, but, but we also have rules such as, you know, quotas um, or, you know, size of fish that can be taken in. Um, and if it's below that, you know, it has to go back, um, et cetera. So, so the commons is this combination of, of three things, a resource, a community, and the rules by which the community can use that resource. Um, so at the common stack, we're, we're aiming to build tools that improve uh, sort of a, a community's ability to uh, raise funds, coordinate on the use of those funds, uh, and, and make decisions together on how to uh, allocate their, their collective resources. So, so just, just a sec, just, um, I mean, a community could be, I mean, just to distinguish something here, obviously that could just be in any enterprise. I mean, a company is, you yeah. know, anything, but what... The Commons Act particularly talks about sustaining public goods. So you don't just mean any uh, corporation or any group who just want to do anything. You mean those who are focused on public goods, i.e. To, to reiterate the definition, let's pick an example. You picked fisheries, fishing, you know, which is a classic thing that can maybe is, is a rivalrous or a subtractable, as it often would be put in the terminology, good, i.e. if I take the fish, you can't take them, but it's difficult to exclude me. There's no way to kind of put a put a line around you know the fishing site anyone can go in there and fish but there are other things which are maybe more classic even public goods which are non-rival and non-excludable for example an idea um anyone you know as jefferson famously said he who gets an idea from me is someone who likes a candle from mine they gain light without darkening me um ideas um street lights were also the classic other example which is the update of jefferson if we put in street lights in a town there's no really way to put a barrier to stop me who hasn't maybe paid for the street lights or you know stops you from using it but also my use of the street light doesn't diminish your use of it um so those kind of goods and what we're saying though is in human history and going back a long way there has been a challenge in maintaining those kind of goods where we can't easily exclude people and also even and especially also for those whether 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 they're rival or non-rival particularly where it's hard to exclude people so we've cut down you know in jared diamond's book collapse you know we cut down too many trees on easter island there are ecological uh collapses going back since basically at least five six seven thousand years as far as we can tell um but in more but, and now today we have challenges like it's hard to fund open source software we're not addressing the climate crisis it's difficult to clean up plastics in the ocean, et cetera, et cetera. So could you say a little bit then about, and, and let's just kind of just delve in just for a moment, sorry, before I go on, it's the challenge in this, is this excludability problem? How do I stop someone coming along who gets to use this resource, who isn't contributing to it? And then the problem that often happens once that starts beginning, if, I, if Jeff knows that Rufus is coming along 
And Jeff is paying for the streetlights, but he knows that Rufus is living in the town, benefiting from the streetlights, but not paying the taxes that he should. Jeff might be like, why am I going to pay taxes? And before you know it, we've kind of gone lower and lower and lower, and then no one is paying for streetlights and there are no streetlights anymore. Um, so that kind of unraveling of the commons or the unraveling of the provision of the public good. So could you speak a little bit then about how particularly for me, um, how you sustain, how does common stack or your work or what you're interested in, or even just the blockchain and Web3 and these technologies, you know, the, the bonding curve, all of this stuff, how do you think it helps us sustain public goods? Sure. Yeah, you, you touched on a lot of interesting points there. And I think what, what you um, what you just laid out that, you know, I'm not willing to pay because you're going to use it without being willing to pay. This is this is a classic example of the free rider problem, um, also known as the prisoner's dilemma, which also kind of, you know, when you scale it up is is the tragedy of the commons. You know, everyone who takes but isn't willing to give, um, you know, adds up to that that small problem that suddenly becomes a, a big problem. Um, and I, I you also mentioned that you know what the, the the tools I'm talking about could be used by any enterprise. You know, for example, in in private goods production, and I agree, there's there's definitely um, overlap with you know existing um, sort of incentive models. You know, companies um, use some of these tools already. You know, they they issue stock, they give that stock to their employees. Their employees are now stakeholders. If the employees work hard, that stock may go up in value. Everyone is now a winner. You're, you're including, you're, you're putting a boundary around the firm um, and, you're, and you're growing together. Um, and, and this is very similar mechanism to what we're talking about, but now we're applying it to you know, things that don't have that explicit boundary. So this could be just an amorphous community. Um, it, it doesn't even have to be uh, a geographically located community. It could be a global purpose-driven community. So you're, you're, you know, you're orienting around a specific problem, for example, you know, trash cleanup or um, climate, um, you know, climate change mitigation, as opposed to, you know, my, my geographically located community wants to, wants to do this. Um, we can have globally um, purpose-driven communities that, um, you know, don't require, um, you know, to be, to be physically co-located to, to address problems together. Um, so, so on to the question: How do these tools help us coordinate? Um, I think it is it is less about excluding the people who don't pay, and more about um, aligning the incentives of the people who do, such that it's a win-win-win example. Um, so, I, I think we're verging on a new form of digital public goods, um, and this is, I mean, it comes down to it, money. Um, if we, as a community, come together, let's say you and me and 20 of our friends, um, we have a local problem. Maybe um, there's too many potholes on our road. And I mean, this, this isn't necessarily it's, an issue. We, we, could yeah, take your trash here. we could take your trash hero example. Maybe sure. Here. Yeah. And work it through. So I, I even if that's OK, I might just uh, just give me a second because I kind of I did a maybe a small change to it and you can correct me uh, as sure. I as I uh, do it, if I do it right or, or, or wrong. Um, sure. I can put it in here, but we can kind of walk it through and I can add annotations, which would be awesome. So I'm just going to yeah. share my screen yeah. and I'm going to pick, I think, I think it's this one. Here we go. Um, so people, the audience uh, who are listening in can kind of follow along. So that's, that's what I'm getting at the beginning is there's this kind of like, there's, there's a project in this case, I think I'm, and I'm re referring here to just for the audience, we'll put it in the show notes, but a great blog post in 2018 about this kind of trash hero project. So do you want to, I'm going to kind of add notes, but do you want to walk us through? And I, I, I can always, I may have made a few tweaks, but feel free to like correct me to the original. I, right? I think it's here. This article. Here we are. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, do you want to start us? We've got this project. We're in. We need to clean up the beaches. Yeah. So um, so Trash Hero is an organization. Actually, they're spreading throughout Southeast Asia. Uh, but when I when I was there, they were starting off in in southern Thailand. Um, and they were doing amazing work. They were getting together a bunch of volunteers each week. Um, they were going around to businesses in the area and asking for donations, uh, for supplies, you know, uh, trash bags, um, protective gloves, um, some beers after for the volunteers, um, you know, and, and obviously their, their costs have expanded with, with teams and, and um, advocacy and, and whatnot in the, in the years since. Um, but, 
you know, a common issue was raising funds to procure materials to, to enable this great work to continue. Um, so the, this was one of the examples that I, that I used in my initial uh, 2017 article um, talking about some of these tools. And, and one of those tools is, is called a bonding curve. Um, and, and a bonding curve, I mean, it's, it's essentially a, a mechanism to issue a token based on um, assets placed into reserve. So um, one thing to know about, about blockchain technologies is we have something called smart contracts. Um, and smart contracts are essentially ways um, to have like, programmable money, uh, if you want to put it simply. So, you know, if X happens, then um, send Y funds here. Um, and you, you could do all sorts of, um, you know, fancy um, programmatic uh, commands for how, how the money should, should operate. Um, but what we're focused on here is, yeah, yeah. Can please. I just check yeah, in? Please. So for audience, like for people, because I kind of had to do a bit of reading about bonding curves. But I mean, to be fair, like just if I, I tell me if I'm getting this wrong, but you could just think, imagine a normal company, it can issue shares. And, and often a lot of the discussion, I think most of the audience members, if they're not familiar, could just replace the word token with share. So there's like this trash year project it might be nonprofit, but it doesn't really matter for the moment, but it's kind of got these shares that's going to issue. And the point is we could write an algorithm. It doesn't matter whether we were on the blockchain for this moment, I have to say or not, but I've kind of like, I can issue like a, a share with a kind of predefined algorithm of what price I'll sell shares at. So at the beginning, you know, you could probably pay a dollar and get one share of the trash hero uh trash hero i think it's trash hero thc you would call trash hero coin, token or yeah, yeah. Trash hero coin exactly <laughs> and then later on the price will this is what we mean by the bonding curve the price will have gone up so at some later point when more tokens of more shares have got issued maybe i've issued a thousand shares now from my project the price to buy a share will go up and this is like maybe like a normal company the the analogy here is that normally if i buy into an enterprise you could have, you know, I don't know, let's speak Facebook, you know, at the very beginning, you know, Peter Thiel bought his shares in Facebook at a really low price. And then when you bought shares, you know, 10 years later, they were much more expensive because Facebook had got really successful. So the, I'm, I'm just thinking the analogy of real life is that share prices, you hope, uh, go up. But here it's kind of fixed. And the point is that you've sort of automated the ability of a treasury in a company to issue shares to people. And it should be said to buy them back. Um, it can, and that can also be determined to buy them back at a different, uh, normally lower price. It's almost always obviously set up <laughs> that the company can sell its shares um, and then buy them back at some different, but normally lower price. And that's what the bonding curve describes is this token supply. And this is the diagram from Jeff's piece, just to acknowledge there's this increasing number of shares or tokens issued and the price to buy a token is going up. And here I've done it in dollars, I think, but you did it in Ether or, but just to make it easy for the audience, maybe less familiar with Bitcoin or Ether, whatever. So just to walk this through, how, so th there's this project, imagine that there is this, this real project, Trash Hero, and they decide to form a DAO, which is like a blockchain company or organization, a distributed autonomous organization. That's step three. And they, ish, they kind of create these shares or tokens. And then what happens? That's what I want to understand next. So they're assuring these, you're running Trash Hero Thailand, Jeff is with other people locally, and, you're, and I come along Rufus. And what happens, I know, or Jeff comes along here maybe, but we could have put, you know, Rufus, maybe that, that's even better. Um, I don't want to paste my name. <laughs> what am I doing? Um, uh, uh, I don't know what I'm doing now. Uh, X. I'm going to delete that. Um, so Rufus comes along here, and, and, and what happens then? You, Jeff says to me, hey, you can buy some Trash Hero coin to support the project. Or, or, yeah, tell me how it goes. So, so I want to I uh, play on that um, shares or, or equity analogy uh, a little bit more because it is similar, um, but it is also different in a way. Um, so, I mean, what these, what these tokens are essentially are governance tokens. Um, so, and I mean, you can say shares in some way are governance tokens as yeah. well, because you can vote, generally you vote on who's on the board. Um, yeah. And then the board, uh, you know, decides who's on the executive. Uh, and then the executive decides everything that goes on in the company. So as a, as a shareholder, you have very limited say over, I mean, you're, you're kind of give, giving feedback into the highest level, who's on the board, the board decides the executive, the executive uh, yeah. decides everything else. 
um, not with tokens. It's not bureaucracy. It's it's not a. But just just a second, right. because yeah, well, you keep going on that. I want to come back to the funding question. But okay, yeah, why yeah, would I give yeah. money? But okay, so there's direct more direct democracy in the DAO. I understand yes, that yes. normally. It's more like we vote on every proposal. It's like a company where we vote on every resolution that or every action. Hopefully not. Hopefully yeah. not. Actually, yeah. I, I think that's one of the the, the naiveties of the, <laughs> the current space is that everyone votes on everything, and I think that's another problem. Um, yeah. You know, there's there's this op opposition to hierarchy, and a lot in the crypto space think everyone should decide everything. This also right. doesn't work, and we're seeing that play out in the DAO space now. It's just too much attention overhead for everyone to decide everything all the time. And this is fascinating because I went through this whole cycle, having come from an area that was all yeah. about egalitarian in the 2000s about liquid voting and liquid democracy and part i did a lot of work on participatory budgeting yes we tend to right, right. the wheel but okay so tell me a bit more <laughs> i guess i was just interested so we're right at the beginning and trash your token is getting issued and you're telling me there's also some stuff about it's it's not quite like a share because you're about to say a bit more like what's different from traditional yeah. equity so so essentially this is this is kind of like um an economic game um, to raise funds for a public good. So cleaning a beach is, is a public good, right? Um, right? The people who show up later who had nothing to do with the cleanup, they enjoy a clean beach, but they didn't contribute to the cleanup. So, so this is, this is there that, uh, that free rider problem again. Um, so essentially what, what this technology, these tools is trying to do is align the incentives of people who want to clean beach such that they can A, put in the money to do it. So everyone you know, stands around a table and everyone puts some money on the table. And in exchange for that money, you're issued a token, which is kind of like a, a receipt for the money that you put in. So if you put in you know, 10 bucks and I put in a thousand, then I get uh, uh, more tokens back, right? right. Um, so those tokens are, are good for two things. And you mentioned already that you can sell them back. Um, so I can, I can burn my tokens or give them back to the smart contract and it will issue me um, you know, my, my reserve assets, my dollars, um, probably less than I put in because the, the project needs to fund itself, but I can always exit. But the second thing I can do with those tokens is use them to vote how all of the money is spent. So, yes. I mean, proportionally. So if I put in less money, I have less say. If I put in more money, I have more say. Um, and that's just aligning, you know, the, the sort of, um, um, yeah, that's a bit of a tangent. Um, so we, we've we all come together. We've put our money on this table. We've issued the, the smart contract has issued us the tokens. And now we can allocate basically using participatory budgeting, um, but with some with some key differences. We've got, um, you know, voting participatory budgeting systems are still kind of working with you know, the, the technical debt of voting systems, um, you know, namely that everyone has to get together. We've got to discuss these budgets. We've got to figure out, you know, what the... Before we, before we come to that, so, so wait, sure. wait, so, so, well, okay, let's come to that. So wait, just wait a second, let's keep going. So step five here is we're gonna, there's, there's some project, if I put it more generally, there's like, the, the, now the owners of tokens get to vote uh, what projects to do, yeah? Yes. E.g. Yeah. pay out 10 of these tokens to to someone for cleanup of the beach. Mm -hmm. That was, I think, in the if I go here, I think this was the example. Uh, yeah. you know, so that how do we get more resources? And then we were like, you've, this is the point money's come in. Pe some people. So I, I will come back to that because I've got some questions. But then we organize right. a beach cleanup. And here, here you put is five. I, I'm going to change it a bit, but just to make the numbers easier. But basically, sure. someone pays out 10 trash hero tokens coins to clean up a beach yeah i think this is point about um you know and potentially turn a profit so what how are people so basically people now start coming in because they can get paid money to clean up the beach that's the idea yeah right so so now we have sort of a um a proposal system which is sort of like grassroots democracy um if we in our community of 50 people if i see something that needs to be done i can put in a proposal and say hey um i see this needs to be cleaned up i can do that uh, and, and I just need 10 um, trash hero coins to do that. Um, or maybe I see, you know, hey, there's a big problem in another province or another country entirely. Um, I want to see that um, funded. I can put up a bounty, you know. So a proposal is kind of one side and a bounty is kind of the other. So uh, a bounty is basically like a, you know, a pool of money floating on the internet. And it says, hey, if this beach gets clean, um, and so, and you can verify that it's been cleaned and it can be authenticated that that work has been done, then this money will be released to the wallet that, that achieves that. 
So we, we kind of unlock this like internet based bounty system, you know, where um, we can crowdfund. Um, we want to see, you know, um, these beaches cleaned, or we want to see, you know, 100 ppm drawdown of carbon in the atmosphere. And when that is completed, um, funds are released to the addresses that that participated in that. So I just want to check something here again for myself. I'm not mm -hmm. being, I, as I said, I worked for quite a long time, even as an economics researcher, on this question of how do we fund open source, open knowledge in general. And these ideas, I mean, people have done prizes for mm -hmm. like, state or group funded, the Royal Society uh, for, mm -hmm. for, for the Arts in the UK famously put for prizes in the 18th century. This was a subgroup. This, I, and the general sense is just, just to be clear, these are all great. They're not in it. Then I'm just trying to get at, it's like, okay, so that these are all kind of like things we did before that we can do on the blockchain. What I'm trying to get at here, like maybe to take me back, or I mean, you can go, is why would people put money in? The normal problem with public goods is people don't put enough money in. That, that's, that's why we have a public goods problem. It's why if... You know, it, we, I think we've all, even like if we've lived in a shed house, have a problem of a free rider problem with washing up. We've all seen things in our society that are underfunded. We aren't dealing with the climate crisis. While we do deal with some public goods, mostly that has been through elaborate institutional means called things like the state that make basically, uh, you could call it a very large scale club good. If you're a member of the United States, if you're sitting in the United States, you have to pay tax. And in exchange, you get access to the U.S. military. You get access to the U.S. system of consulates worldwide. You get access to the education system. You get access to all of these things. Um, you know, and I'm trying to understand at the moment, which is this intriguing point of how it says we sustain public goods. There's new ways we can sustain public goods. Walk me through that a bit in this case. What 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 I'm going back even at the stage here is why do people put money in? Why do why does Rufus Bobo Alice and, and, and maybe we're all just like, yeah, I get we can do a tip set up. But even in local communities, we know the limits of that. Like, people, you know, if I, I've tried to do things in my local community and sometimes they succeeded, sometimes they haven't. Why is it people are contributing money in here? And why do we involve all this financial stuff? Why do we need to give money back to people? And because if I'm honest, like some part of it sounds often in the background, people are going to get to speculate in these tokens. And so that's the reason, you know, when I've looked at, you know, some of these projects, the token changes price a lot out there but if, if that speculation wasn't there what's different from just like donating to a, a cause that's why i'm i'm i've still been a bit mystified at so can you can you walk me through that a bit like how sure. how sure. it helps yeah so so i would say donations um fall prey to the free rider problem so yes. you know if if uh, donations are i mean t altruists are wonderful but our system yeah. is systemically burning them out um, because they're expected to give and not receive in return. And, and that is the fundamental difference between the nonprofit sector and the for-profit sector is that, you know, I, I mean, you could probably get a little more nuanced than that, um, but donations are a sucker's game. You give and you get nothing back. Um, so so let's, let's, let's play a little game here. What if we take a nonprofit um, collaboration like Cleaning the Beaches and we make it yes. investable? Now, now that's saying we, we allow people to speculate on cleaning beaches. And, and someone might say immediately, whoa, that's dangerous. We shouldn't allow that. There's, there's a bunch no, of no, issues no, no. here. I'm, I'm good with that. Just take me here if we're looking at it. So yeah. I, let's take Rufus. So at the very beginning, Jeff, you came to me and said, hey, I bought, I'm let's say one of the first buyers. I pay $100 and I get 100 trash hero token, uh, coins. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some of that I get is being used to clean our beach. How do I get money? Like I'm trying to get, how do I get money back? Yeah, like walk me through that a little bit. For sure. That's so, so I mean, if, if, we're, if we're talking about sort of um, global trash cleanup efforts, so I mean, let's say this this community starts with twenty people and it produces a lot of value. You know, we've we've cleaned up a lot of beaches. Um, the people who are in are, are really gung ho. Um, and, you know, some some foreign foundation hears about this or maybe even the government of Thailand itself goes, wow, this is such a great project. Uh, these volunteers have come together, pooled their money and done this. We actually want to support this. Well, now there's there's a pipeline. There's there's a, a, a way to see this is where for profit corporations have an edge over nonprofits is that they have access to global pools of capital. 
Um, right. Investing in Tesla, um, I mean, and look at the speculation that rampant in in the the, the um, stock market these days. You know, Tesla's valued at yeah. how many hundreds of times its its uh, earnings, etc. Um, yeah. But on the flip side, that means that Elon Musk is capitalized to do any moonshot that he can possibly imagine. Go to Mars, dig tunnels under the Earth anything. He's got all the capital available at his fingertips because he has these investable tokens called equities in various yeah. different companies. Um, yes. If we can unlock the, the potential for investment, like right now, what are my options as a, as a millennial in investing? I can buy uh, tech stocks, I can buy blue chips, uh, or I can buy government bonds. What if I could invest directly in climate change token or trash cleanup token? And that uh, meta DAO funded all sorts of on the ground grassroots collaborations in my neighborhood that are doing something that I that I find truly important. I could care less about more Apple flavored computers coming onto the market or more like Tesla's coming out. Sure, all those things are important, but those are the only options we have right now for long-term investing. And I think this will offer the opportunity for people to invest directly in the social initiatives, the environmental initiatives, uh, and, and outside of any individual company doing these things. I think we're really limiting ourselves bit by creating you know, companies who can create equities. With DAOs and tokens, we can literally put our money where our values are, and that, that value can flow according to you know, direct democracy, uh, local participatory budgeting, to all of these on the ground efforts that are actually producing value in the way that we need it. Wait, so let me just let's walk this through though, because there's some. It's I, I get the passion, and I like in a way what's mm -hmm. I'm trying to really get at here is I'm equally passionate about making a trend. Like we need to shift how society is working. What I'm trying to get at though is I don't kind of quite get. So in Tesla, and I follow Tesla quite a bit. At least the vast majority of people there, they may talk obviously many of them i'm not saying don't care about environmentalism but a lot of the talk is like they're going to make money because tesla's going to take over the car market so like the thing is people are giving money because they anticipate some return for that they're going to get more money out than they put in and i'm trying to work out um you know and, and how does that work here let's just kind of really work this through here so i've let's go back and keep concrete i put my money in i put in a hundred dollars for my hundred trash hero coins alice put in more later um how and even here you said it gets the project gets more successful so you know like people the beach is getting cleaned up if i think in your in in your story it's like you know um there you know the, as word spreads about the value created around this positive social endeavor philanthropy local businesses investors want to participate in further common cause and essentially potentially turn a profit that's crucial here a thousand more trash hero coins are purchased, you know, for some, I, I, I've done my calculation here to go with your numbers, uh, which is like, you know, maybe $1,500, right? And so what I'm trying to get get here is I'm trying to understand now, um, there's now, um, uh, oh, sorry, uh, there's there's not trash hero coins in the trilogy. There's now, I think, a $1,500 plus this, which is 290, which is 50, I'm going to have to do 790 dollars not to see in treasury i'm just trying to go through the situation here so i people have bought these trash coins how are they going to turn a profit how you said it's like an investment how does that happen how i that's what i'm trying to understand how do i get my money out again and and for this not to be frankly a pyramid scheme or a Ponzi scheme because how do i get how does everyone get their money out in the end that's what i'm trying to understand if we've spent money on the beach cleanup it just seems to be like like kind of like something doesn't add up for me you know, if everyone receives their money that they put in again, and we spent money on beach cleanup, how is that possible? It's like magic. <laughs> For sure. So, so I guess a couple of a couple of points there. Um, one, everything is a Ponzi scheme. Um, if you if if everyone sold their their Tesla stock right now, um, we would see tens of billions, hundreds of billions of dollars of value, quote unquote, disappear from the face of the earth. Um, there is there is not enough uh, collateral or or reserve backing uh, all of the value that exists. So so just just to like start out that that essentially if you sell everything you know even even the U.S. dollar if everyone sold every U.S. dollar they had 
you would see a massive slide in the value of the U.S. dollar. Um, you, you, like this is this is the in, invisible um, where the market cap illusion um, was was a, a, a nice coin uh, by by Griff Green um, talking about how you know if if everyone sold anything uh, like all houses imagine all houses went up on yeah. the market at once you would see a massive destruction of value so i think to say you know wait, 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 wait a minute first of all yeah. there's a very because we're doing something here that i see in this community like sometimes happen which is we're using words in subtly different ways at different moments so yes and no so the word value economists would use it quite specifically there'd be a vast mm. destruction in price like in prices sure. and in, 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 in like what you could call monetary, like what people have measured, but not necessarily in any value. Like just to be clear, and this is a very Bitcoin. important thing. There are things which have use value and things that don't. Bitcoin has no use value. In, in that sense, also the US dollar has no use value. It is the US dollar, at least, is a currency. It's a medium of exchange, a potential store of value, various other things. Bitcoin, we, we, you know, we could come to is it a currency, is it not? But just to be really distinct here, when normally we invest in Tesla, while Tesla's market cap could massively diminish, ultimately Tesla are making cars. There should be some residual value. Why Tesla wouldn't go to complete zero? I mean, it could do, it could go bankrupt and things, but at least its equity has, or, or the value of the enterprise has some lower bound is because they're building freaking cars that people can drive around and use. There's some use value. So just before we get maybe in the, because I triggered this off on punching, let's stick here on the trash euro coin. Yes. How do people, how does everyone, because we say at some point in this blog here, we say people and potentially turn a profit. As word spreads about it, people turn a profit. Even the people you said who initially invested, one of the reasons millennials might be interested is they can do good and they can make money. So how does that work here? How do people sure. get their money out? Walk me through so, that. So this this is a really good distinction: use value and exchange value. Um, so yeah. so I think there's a couple of interesting things to explore here because the the use value of a clean beach is not zero. Our current economy treats it like it's zero, um, but actually, you know, environmental services are are a massive and up and coming uh, uh, industry. So you know, yeah. I, I'm not sure if you've come across social impact bonds and outcomes payments. Yes, I'm um, very familiar with social impact bonds. Yes, cool. but but wait a moment. So, wait a so, moment. Just not yeah. that question though. Yeah. How do we get our money out? Like I'm trying to understand that. To tell me, sure. take me through it. Like here, how do I get my money out from the trash euro coin? I want to understand that for a moment. So, I, so well, the the simple answer to that is you sell it back to the bonding curve. So right. if you bought in, if you bought in early. Um, and a lot of people bought it after, and I know I'm discussing just simple Ponzi dynamics, so there's there's more coming yes. after this. But if you yes. were an, on the initial founding group of Trash Hero Coin, and you worked hard, and you turned this into an international sensation, which has happened, by the way, without without a token at all, um, but the, the growth of value production in this community has grown massively. Um, what would happen if there were a token at the beginning, the value of the token would likely have appreciated massively and people who bought earlier can sell and, and earn a profit. So this is the, the bare symbol. This, this is on this, just on this, on this curve here. It's like I bought here on the blue curve and then I'm going to sell here later on the red curve. That's right. basically what we're doing. OK, got it. OK, great. So, so this is this is one way. Um, of course, you could you 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 do have multiple uses for the token. So what we talked about just now was the exchange value, right? Yeah. I can sell it back at that amount, but the token yeah. also has a second value and it's, it's actually a use value. It's a governance value because all of the tokens govern the shared treasury. So let's just, pretend there's that, that isn't, Yeah, that isn't use value in the technical meaning of use value. But what I get it, they have another use, which is they give you vote some degree of participation in the voting control of this enterprise but this enterprise isn't making money right it's cleaning up beaches but it has money from the people who have contributed so but, but, so it's but it's yes, but wait wait a minute they don't have any yeah. the amount that went in must be the no more the, the, how is money increasing in the enterprise because we're paying money out for the projects well you you have a difference between the buy curve and the sell curve uh -huh. um, so so essentially within the within the commons uh, we call it the commons market maker, the augmented bonding curve. Um, you yes. have you have a reserve pool. So this is the the hard assets that are available for withdrawal. So whenever wait, anyone wait, sells back to the bonding curve, but if everyone cashes out, if everyone wants to sell their tokens in the end, 
how can they get their money back? Because well, well, there would be there would be diminishing returns. Here who bought here, at some point, the last person to buy, let's just walk this through. The last person, let's say the last purchase happened here on this bonding curve, right? Then they're never, this, this, bar, this the sell curve they can sell back at is way below the price they bought at. So they're out of pocket. I get their money can pay off these people, but that's why I'm saying, how did these people, let's say this is the last person after this, no one buys more tokens. How do they get their money back? So, so let's let's walk through a couple of scenarios. Yeah. Um, well, one, if you're the last person holding tokens, so let's say let's say there were 50 people in this community and 49 yes. have sold their tokens, and I'm the only one left. So yeah. the tokens that I hold govern the entire treasury of the project. So even though my tokens exchange value is maybe 10 cents on the dollar for what I paid for it, the tokens that I hold govern the entire treasury of that community. And but everyone, no as they sold- Wait, wait a moment, the they, treasury is empty, treasury. sold out. No, the reserve is empty, but the treasury, so this is, and actually maybe this is worth uh, me no, pulling up a diagram. This, we've got to work this through just mathematically. Let's pick it here. Let's just pick it here. Let's just do the actual numbers for a second here. I don't know why my annotations seem to still be going. I need to clear them. Let me just clear, clear all drawings just for a second. Let's walk this through. So let's call this as uh, like Amy, uh, a purchase for EG1500 by, by Amy. So there's four people in this project, right? Rufus, Bob, Alice, and a, uh, I should call her, uh, I don't know, Deirdre or something. I should call her something beginning with D. So how does Deirdre, let's just walk this through. Let's say at Rufus, Bob, and Alice have got their money back. like. They're, they're three, in this case, $330 are taken out, right? If they, or even more, they're paid more out than they put in, let's say, right? They're paid $500. So let's say at some point, let's just, just at the moment, are now, so let's say I withdraw. I just, I, I'm just trying to get this here. I'm doing the withdrawal step. So let's say, let's just put it here, like Rufus, uh, uh, what was it, like Alice and Bob, withdraw their tokens their, their, or sell their tokens, right? Uh, like they're, they're, they're 300 tokens for let's say $500. Yeah, that's more than they put in. That implies in the treasury, there are now $1,290 left in the treasury. So, so we're, we're, we're making a, a, we're conflating two things here. There's the reserve and there's the treasury or the common pool. So do you, do you want me to share my screen? I, I think we're missing yeah, an important yeah, you mechanism. Share, you share your screen for a moment. I think we're missing an important mechanism of, because yeah. we're, we're actually proposing beyond um, bonding curves, we're, we're talking about what you might call the augmented bonding curve or, yeah, or the I, commons I, market maker. I read about that too, but I, I, cool. I still just don't get the, 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 uh, the mathematical accounting here. Yeah. So, so, I mean, may, perhaps what you're trying to get at is, you know, is it possible for everyone to enter this community and exit with more money than they started? No, that, that's no. impossible. Like there's, right. yeah, no, I, I'll be straight up. No. Um, if, it, right. especially if you're looking at something that begins and ends and there's no other money coming in other than people's money. Right. No. Okay. You can, you can. So, so there's a couple of things here. Um, one, I mean, you, you could have, uh, revenue coming from the outside. For example, if the trash hero community worked with the Thai government and said, hey, we are going to clean up 100% of your beaches, 100% free of trash. And if we do that, can we have an outcomes payment of $500,000? Because it's actually saving you a million dollars in like, um, you know, dead fish and, you know, aquatic damage cool. and blah, blah, blah. And the, the Thai government might say, hey, we save $500,000 by giving you $500,000. If you complete this, great. There's revenue. So, wait, wait, so this wait, 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 but Jeff, Jeff, there's something really yeah. important yeah. that moment to emphasize and also for listeners. But at that moment, you have great, but you shifted from basically talking about public goods funding to kind of in your diagram. And I, if I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to have it too, I, I don't want to stop your screen. I, but we've moved mm -hmm. from funding excludable, non excludable things to either a someone funding the public goods some other entity funding public goods so you've moved the public goods funding to the thai government which is 
You've moved it out of trash year. A trash year is not solving a public goods problem anymore. The Thai government is, and it's happy to give money, which is an age old thing. The, the governments give money to all kinds of people to deliver services that they want, public goods services. For sure. It doesn't mean those entities doing delivering the public service are solving the public goods problem. It's the government solving the public goods problem. I, I, I would disagree, actually. I, I think this is a union of concerned citizens who come together and crowdfund their own money. This is a new part. The new part is not the, the outcomes payment. This already exists okay. with social okay. impact bonds. Okay. So, so a lot of, and I, I want to caveat here, there's a lot of new things here that are combinations or blurring lines of old things. So, cool. so there's, it's not saying this is an entirely new thing. It's cool. saying, hey, how can we use interesting incentive mechanisms um, to crowdfund money and give democratic local participatory budgeting over those funds and yeah. how can we tie in other revenue sources because ultimately right if you're putting in money and then spending that money and then you want to get that money back it's not there anymore it's gone so so it's how gone. do we but, that, that's right. but, the, but the thing i'm trying to get out here that just for me is i spent like quite a long time examining how to solve public goods problem this is a topic i'm really fascinated in, is the heart of the climate crisis but what i'm trying to get at is how like the essence of the public goods problem is the free rider problem. And I'm trying to understand how, whether the tools at Common Stack or otherwise, or the bonding curve solve that, because what you're telling me is there are people who basically give money and they don't get it back. And I'm like, great. But the, the traditional logic, which you told me even earlier in the call is that donations don't really cut it. There's a great limit to donations. And the solution to that is that people have this incentive, they can make money, but then we're just saying, but they, some people at least can't make money. Uh, you know, like as a net well, overall, it's gotta be a net negative game. Okay, like, let, let's look at let's look at some assumptions here, though, yeah. like yeah. Some, some further assumptions are to make money from the system, I have to sell all my tokens. That's not necessarily true. Like I can I can hold Tesla for 10 years or 20 years. Why can't I hold THC trash hero coin for 10 years or 20 years or even the rest of my life? Maybe, you know, this this could be an asset that I could borrow against in another currency without even selling my trash euro coin. But it's only an asset. But Jeff, we've got to be strict here. It's only an asset because someone believes that. So, so what I'm trying to say is we've got something which mathematically has to be a zero sum. Like there's two ways it can either go. Either it is a net, net either zero sum or negative sum game where what I take out has to be less than what was put in overall by everyone at least. So, so someone has to be left holding or it's able to generate revenue. Now, if it's able to generate revenue, that's great. The thing, of course, is the traditionally public goods provision, it's very hard to generate revenue. I myself have run an open source software company. I am very present to how difficult it has been to make money from providing open source software. So I'm just trying to get at, which is you, you can't have one's cake and eat it. Either it's a negative sum game or zero sum game, which looks like donations, which we know are the limits to the scaling of that because people don't scale it. Or it has a revenue model. Now, if it has a revenue model, you've got to ask mm -hmm. how it has a revenue model. And the revenue, like when you say about Tesla, I, people hold Tesla or sell it because they anticipate it's going to continue making money or whatever. If there is a revenue model, the question for public goods is how, what is your revenue model? What is trash euro tokens model? And, and you've mentioned that the what one option is the, the, the Thai government pays for it or other philanthropists pay money to it. Sure, but that's just moving the public goods question somewhere else. I'm really in search of something that genuinely smells to me. And I'm being like, I'm so interested and excited, A, by the goodwill of people like yourself, and also by the possibility there is something there. But I, I've got to like be like, show me the money a bit like me metaphorically, like where do we solve the free rider problem here? Sure. In terms of, 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 and I'm not, I'm, I'm just really like, ah. Oh. So, so I, I think you might be stuck in some false dichotomies there, um, saying it, it has to be this or this. I actually think this technology is something that blurs the lines between this or that, and it allows us to have potentially the best of both, or maybe the worst of both, um, and, and probably both, as it were. Um, so, so I want to come back to this, because outcomes payments aside, um, I, I think this is a very interesting technology that can create new pipes or, or payment rails for public goods. So, And I think that lowering the barriers to essentially running local impact, social impact bonds with outcomes payments at a local level, this is already game changing. But we don't even have to go into delivering that external revenue because you're proposing that moves us into a different game. Um, cool. Let's just let's just keep it with the um, original token economics. So go back to this point earlier. 
Um, we've got the reserve and we've got the treasury. So those are two different things within the augmented bonding curve. So the reserve is what you can reclaim your money against. So yep. this is the hard assets. If I sell my tokens back to the bonding curve, I'm pulling out of the reserve. However, whenever anyone leaves they or, or joins, they pay a tax. And that yep. tax is essentially, it doesn't go back to the community member, it goes into the treasury. So we have a treasury that is being filled every time someone leaves, let's say. So let's walk back through the scenario that you said, everyone is leaving and I'm the last person there. I'm the, I'm the sucker, right? Well, A, first, like, look at the scenario. Um, it looks kind of like a donation. I put in a hundred dollars, everyone left and I was the last person holding. I get back five bucks. I'm like, oh man, I totally got ripped off. Yet I'm still $5 better off than if I had just donated. So first of all, the worst case in this token bonding curve scenario is so the best case in the donation the scenario. So, so, so wait, in the best case here, I, 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 but what, wait a moment. It's a bit of a say that I contributed $95 donation. It would be the way to look at it. I mean, I, it's not sure. I, I mean, I, I just do understand. Sure. So I, yeah, I understand. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. But okay. But the thing is in that logic also, how can I, have, if I, that means in total, given that everyone got their money back or more, and I got, I, that means that the project, the only money the project actually had was the difference between, like all the project has is what I then donated, which is the $95. You know what I mean? So you can't have our cake and eat it. If we want to fund public goods at scale, then the amount people have to donate has to be a lot. And no one's ever donated. Like philanthropy is, is a fraction today. First of all, it's dominated by the rich and powerful, but it's also a fraction of what states contribute. So I'm just Maybe. I'm just trying to go back is to 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 a little bit to be like what and what stopped this before like I could have set up a company before and just been like hey we're gonna go and do this like not a philanthropic endeavor you're gonna put money in some of it will go to do solve the solution and some I just don't understand why giving people the money back makes any difference that's why I'm also trying to intrigued by why why invent all this elaborate financial stuff basically to wrap up a donation why not just have people donate. Sure, sure. Well, I think there's another assumption that we're jumping to here is that that everyone will sell um, because like in, in this scenario, we can see there's there's competing pressures within this ecosystem because these tokens have multiple use cases. Um, one is exchange value. So, for example, when the price is really high, you might see sell pressure, right? If you bought this token at a dollar and now it's 100, you might sell some. Um, so there's sell pressure, which is meaning there's there's more and more people leaving, the price of the token decreases, but also the treasury is filling up because the more people leave. Now let's move away from like a, a 50 person commons to a 50,000 or 500,000 person commons, perhaps in some someday. Now this treasury is filled up maybe with uh, $50,000, $500,000, a million dollars. And let's pretend that we go back to everyone has sold except me. Um, so the, the tokens that I hold are 100% of the treasury allocation power. So anyone who sees value in allocating a million dollars earmarked for trash cleanup is going to potentially buy back into this community. So we have some sell pressure because people want to capitalize on the exchange value, but we also have buy pressure because people want to capitalize on the use value. And I know you mentioned this, this wasn't necessarily use value, but I would, I would actually argue that in this new type of digital public good, where we all stand around a table, we put money on the table, we receive tokens, which then steer those funds, the, yeah. the use value of that token is the steering. So when you use that token, if, if there's a million dollars on the table and I'm the only one steering, then I can steer that towards whatever I like. But Jeff, you can't have the cake and eat. I'm just going to push it. If there's, I'm the only one left, there aren't a million dollars on the table. The only way yes. that, 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 ah. that they don't go together, this... I only end up with a lot of money left and I'm the only one left. I have to have paid out, or at least either people, my question here is either people haven't got their money back, the people who've sold out didn't get their money back, which means there is a lot of money left. Or you, you're conflating get... the reserve and the treasury again. No, so no, the no, reserve. No, 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 no. I, I'm not confusing them. Wait, wait a second. Let's just go through it. Let's say a million dollars came into this. And let's say 90% okay. of it, let's call it 50, even 50, 50, 50% 50 went there to the reserve in your diagram here. I don't know if you can draw it, the reserve, e.g. die. And 50% yeah, yeah. of it went to the common pool. That yeah, means yeah. if everyone withdrew their money from the reserve, they could have only got 50% of their money back. So either, I'm just trying right. to say this either or, either people don't get most of their money back, in which case it looks like a donation setup, like they contributed 50% of whatever they put into this project, 
into the common pool or they they did get most of their money back in which case very little money is in the common pool what i'm saying is you can't have once cake and eat it this idea just for me i'm just struggling with to be like how novel it's like yeah i could have set up organizations for years where i say like even impact investments look like that your investors we're going to do good and you're going to get a load of money back like they are in fact investors because they're going to do some revenue model and so on but here let's just go on a pure there's more zero sum what's set up Either money went into the common pool, in which case it's not in the reserve to pay people back, or it stayed in the reserve to pay people back. You can't be, For sure. you can't be both an investor For sure. and so, investing not in the common pool. For sure. So, so again, I, th I think we have this fallacy of um, what happens when everyone sells. Um, I mean, if you look at any real world asset and presume that everyone sells, this, this, the, the end result is going to be disaster. If everyone sold Tesla, if everyone sold their house, if everyone sold anything, and, and this is again. no, 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 no. But we're confusing two things here. Then again, there's a slate of hand, and we want to walk this through for ourselves. There's a difference between what happens if people did, and what would happen to the market price, and what would actually happen to the economic, what would be called economic value in the company. So if everyone tomorrow, it's like the famous story of Buffett, or ever like, or of of, of, of most investing literature. There's, there's, there's like the, there's like, there's the weighing and the voting machine. Tesla's value changes nothing when its share price changes. The value of Tesla is the value of it as an enterprise producing cars to people. That value does not change when a share price changes. If you mean what does its share price change, or does the pr the price that you can sell your shares for change? Well, of course it changes by definition. Now the question is. You're asking is what happens in unraveling? I'm pointing out you have a circumstance here where it's known that the amount of money you're getting out is less than is being put in, at least must be at the end. That kind of system tends to unravel because they're called Ponzi or pyramid schemes because at some point they should recurse back. They don't always, sometimes they stay up, it is true, but normally they don't. The reason that Tesla doesn't unravel is not because everyone's just in some belief equilibrium today, it's because even if everyone sold all their sold their shares today, there would be a remaining a car company with billions of dollars of value. It might not be worth four billion. I actually, I, actually I, yeah? I just want to challenge that a moment because I have a feeling if everyone sold every stock of Tesla, even at Elon Musk, there would be massive deleveraging. I mean, the, the company is you know borrowing billions. All all of this, you know, we can say, oh, it comes down to car production, but I honestly believe that these companies are supported more by corporate welfare, by being able to launch an equity, et cetera. I, I really think it would not just be status quo tomorrow at the Tesla factory of, 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 if the value of Tesla stock was suddenly zero. Of course. I, I don't both, think that would that would of continue. Of course it's both. What you're making so, the sort of points, one, your ability to raise money. It's a point that's been made about meme stocks, funnily, which is the very ability to be a meme stock allows you to raise money that can allow you to pay off your debts. Like GameStop would have gone bankrupt. But the thing is, as an economy-wide level, you can't keep doing that. There can be a few Teslas. There can be a few speculative bubbles. But the level of economy, when you do that, you're burning a huge amount of value on things you shouldn't. You, you know, for example, you're, you're giving lots of money to Elon Musk to do things that probably aren't useful, maybe in the long run, for example. So I'm just going to be a little bit. So one is we're confusing something again there, which is say, I said, why does it not recurse backwards? You ask the question, why does the, 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 the scheme not unravel? Oh, like all stocks are pyramid schemes. I'm saying, no, they're not, because there's this underlying, there is an underlying use value. There's an underlying economic value. It's true that we have speculative bubbles. The question I'm also asking here is, are speculative bubbles something to be like welcomed in our society or something to be like suppressed? The traditional view has been, and there has been an argument like speculative bubbles allowed for the railway investment in the 20th, the 19th century. There's this kind of story. But in general, there's a sense that speculative bubbles lead to capital misallocation, i.e. people spend money on things they shouldn't do, and that's bad. And then normally they also end in credit crunches and like deleveraging and lots of pain later. And then if we, in general, one of the reasons we have huge amounts of developed securities regulation over the last 100, 100, well, 100 years is to build public trust, reduce the risk of like, at least kind of scams, speculative bubbles that go badly because that reduces the trust in public capital markets and then re reduces money for the next Tesla. So it's right, Tesla has a load of money now, but if Tesla abuses that trust or anyone else abuses that trust, they the are. Future, you have less money. <laughs> but, uh, well, I, I agree on that one. But the question I'm trying to get at here is you and I are fascinated and committed to how we can better 
address the public goods problems? How can we fund public goods problems yes. at scale? I think is the question we yes. both share. And I'm just pressing to say, hey, because, because I want to end it, there's an alternative. There's a lot of work that goes into like token engineering or doing this stuff. That work could be spent being on the streets with Extinction Rebellion. It could be spent being on the streets, like trying to change hearts and minds. It could be spent starting new political parties. Um, I had this discussion with Klima Dow. There's a tendency that we, that, that when we, that, that there's like, it's like a kind of, it's costless to go do this stuff. And so my question is, if we're not, we really wanna be sure for ourselves that there really is something at the end of the rainbow here in terms of something that's gonna address public goods from, it's why I'm pressing you, I hope politely and generously. Absolutely. Cool. Absolutely. Get, for sure. The root of it. So maybe I'll sure. the last words to you in, in this one. But what is it? The, what? How is it that this magic happens? How is it that we can both maybe? How do we go beyond donations, which may are limited in scope, but something which isn't compulsory like the state? Because that seems to be the dream here. We can have something that's participatory, voluntary, democratic, but yet scales beyond what is traditionally donations. For sure. So probably, yeah, so leave a word to you on that. Yeah, I, I think you know coming to um, one of the one of the comments you made. How does everybody leave, um, or or if everyone leaves and and takes more than they you know if everyone profits, you know how is that possible? Um, there's there's no claim that everyone in these systems profits. Um, there's no claim in the, in the stock market either that you know by by buying stocks you profit. That's that's not a rule, um, you know. And yet it's still an effective way for for capital allocation. So the the claim of these tools is not you know, come in here, fund public goods, everybody wins. It's let's create an economic game where first and foremost, we fund public goods. Use value is the beaches are clean or the carbon is drawn down or the, the open source software is produced. That's, that's, the, that's the use value. Um, now, people may profit from this if they, because speculation is a funny thing. It's not, it's not one thing. There's no speculation is bad or speculation is good. Um, risk is a real thing. Um, over overindulgence in that risk, maybe we can call it speculation. So if I'm going around picking all the, the, the new unicorns, I wanna find the next Facebook before it's big, right? Or I wanna find the trash cleanup initiative that's really gonna clean up this world. And I wanna invest in that before it's huge. This is risk. And, that, and that's actually a healthy signal to the market. You know, If there is an up and coming company that's, that's stock valuation is going up and it's producing really valuable projects, people are going to start looking at that. Um, so this isn't necessarily a signal. It's it's when that growth becomes cancerous and growth for growth's sake is when it becomes a, 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 a harmful effect. Um, so I think in these tools, we, we ultimately face the same challenges. So it's not about creating something where everybody wins or it only goes up. It's about creating economic games that a, are better than donations because maybe some people got out at a profit and hey, they were there first funding that initiative on the ground before it was a thing. When there was high risk, they probably deserve some profit for that. Some people may have broken even, some people may have sold at a loss, but keep in mind that selling at a loss is still better than a donation. Because if you put in a hundred bucks and you got out 20 and beaches got cleaned up, great. It's still better than donating a hundred bucks because you're, you're 20 bucks up on that. So even a loss is better than today's current system. So first of all, I'd like to, to get away from the, the idea that everybody wins. That's, that's not the point of these, that, that everybody profits. The point is to create interesting new mechanisms that A, are investable, uh, B, have multiple uses. So I, I don't think we went through this quite enough, but the fact that there are different pressures for selling and different pressures for buying creates you know some potential volatility in price and the volatility in price contributes to the, the treasury because every time people buy or people sell uh we're funding the project so it's kind of like create it's it's market design essentially it's it's commons based market design so we can put capital in service to real value as opposed to capital running the show and real value you know today we have the dog wagging or the, the tail wagging the dog or the cart before the horse. It's, it's capital first and labor and value second, if at all, uh, a distant, distant second. Um, what these tools offer us is a new design space. Um, and I know we've, we've gone over this trash hero example. This is very out of date. Um, it's several years old. So I, I apologize for the simplicity of the, of the you know, numbers chosen and whatnot. 
Um, it's definitely not not to be taken, you know, mathematically, as I see you've, you've tried to work through, which is great. Um, but there's much more advanced um, um, simulations of that and, and examples going on, you know, with people <laughs> experimenting with these tools that I would love to uh, chat with you further about. Um, and, and we didn't even get into, you know, novel forms of voting. Um, the way that we can vote with these tokens is very interesting as well. It doesn't have to be discrete voting where, you know, we only vote once every four years and say, okay, who's going to make all the decisions? Um, this is kind of how we think of voting, at least in, in modern day. Um, but with blockchains, we have rich temporal data streams, and we have tokens that we can continually assert our preferences. So I think this also opens up a whole new area for participatory budgeting and, and localized democracy in that we can continuously, if you think of society as a signal processing system where tokens can be used, you know, in, um, you know, it's not also not about one token ecosystem, it's about a token mesh. Uh, where we can have, you know, trash hero token, you can have plant a tree token, you could have global hun hunger token, you could have carbon drawdown token. And all of these aren't zero sum in that, you know, I'm going to buy it and then sell it and try to make a profit. Maybe I want to hold those in my portfolio for the long term. Um, and this is where it comes back down to, you know, are these zero sum? Well, if everybody sells after every beach cleanup, yes, you're going to have some winners and some losers. But if you have an enduring economy and if there's other use for those tokens as well, for example, maybe Subway wants to give you 10% off a sub if you hold 10,000 trash hero tokens, or maybe the municipal government will give me a break on my taxes if I hold carbon drawdown tokens. So it's essentially creating an open infrastructure or piping for all of these potential other revenue sources also to feed in. So it's not just, you know, the, the mechanism is this magic money creation or not, it's how do we create uh, composable systems that deliver win-win-win benefits to, to multiple sectors in society. That's great, Jeff. Thank you so much. And it sounds like we should have a follow-up. So there might be a part two to this where we can dig deep <laughs> yeah. into those things you just shared, the mesh. So really, thank you so much for your time, your energy, and the commitment. I think we all shared or a radically wiser well of world. Uh, tune in for the next episode. I think there will be of this, it sounds like. Uh, all the best to our listeners. You can find out more about this project at web3.lifeitself.us. And the show notes will be up there soon and more discussions like this. Thank you so much and all the best.